This is the Livable Future podcast, and in today's episode, we're talking about community access and engagement with nature and science. Last week, we spoke with Dr. Gillian Bowser and Sarah Whipple about the YAN Network and opening up opportunities for the next generation of environmental scientists to work and think in an intercultural space. This week, we're talking about Dr. Bowser and Sarah's background in the broader community's engagement through community science, also known as citizen science. First, we wanted to know how Sarah and Dr. Bowser first got into environmental science. We call this the scientist's origin story, like a superhero. But really, everyone has an origin story of how they got to where they are now. So Sarah, what's your scientist origin story? How did you get involved in the environmental sciences? Yeah, um, my science origin story, I don't know, it's its not anything super unique. Um, I was raised in a family of, of doctors and my grandpa makes the joke that I'm uh, getting the wrong doctor degree um, as we speak, but I uh, took a field course in high school, actually, ironically enough, with one of Gillian's graduate school buddies um, at a really small university in Maine called College of the Atlantic. And we were on a canoe for a month and a half catching frogs. And that was my introduction to fieldwork and ecology. And the class was also centered around environmental policy and water law um, work. And, you know, I fell in love with being outside and spending time in nature and um, doing science, you know, on on top of all of um, the experiential learning that we were able to do. And so that kind of propelled me into uh, looking at college programs that were tied to environmental science, where I could continue to gain some experience in the field and doing research outside. And then I met Gillian. Um, I enrolled for this program through the Ecosystem Science and Sustainability Department at CSU um, called SUPER, which stands for Skills and Undergraduate Participation in Ecological Research. Gillian ended up being my mentor for that. I dropped some of the work because I was trying to support myself a little bit more with school and needed to get some funding tied to, um, you know, just my day-to-day life. And then Gillian offered me a, a job to work in the lab as a research assistant and the rest is history. I don't think we've parted ways since then. <laughs> so it's kind of a a little bit more linear of a pathway than I think some students are used to. But um, just seeing so much science in my family growing up really inspired me to find out what excited me about science. And I, I wouldn't have it any other way. I followed up with Sarah asking what about this experience led to her getting a degree in this field? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and you know, what I was doing in that first field experience is completely different from what I'm doing now in that um, I'm in the mountains as opposed to by the ocean. And we were in a canoe for a month and a half. <laughs> and I had never canoed prior to the experience of being in the middle of nowhere in upstate Maine, <laughs> um, canoeing and catching frogs. That was the main objective was to look for these invasive um, frogs and toads that have um, come into this river called the Allagash River um, that's in upstate Maine. And um, yeah, I mean, I think just the experience of being with like-minded people and at the same time feeling so alone in that solitude, it's a very rural part of the country. And um, lots of logging going on in that area. Um, And so just seeing, you know, not that many people, but natural resources being taken out of this this space and um, the destruction that humans have caused on that space was really um, thought provoking and motivating as to, you know, we need to, I need to do something to, um, you know, change people's minds and act on these problems that we have as humans have put on the world. And obviously I'm not doing, you know, water rights or um, frog research now, but I think just that ability to work with like-minded peers, be in an area that's so um, remote, but still has seen the destruction that um, 
humans have caused to our planet um, was kind of the the um, propellant that I needed in order to take the next step and, and pursue a degree in, in environmental science. Dr. Bowser's origin story followed a different arc. You know, it's an interesting little story that the, the guy who helped write and found the National Park Service, Frank Law Olmsted, um, helped write the, the act that created the National Park Service, was this, the grandson of the person who designed Central Park. And the philosophy behind designing Central Park was that urban people needed nature and that parks should be part of a city infrastructure. So I think it's in, that for me is an important tie that city parks and play a super important role on how we view our environment, um, whether it has concrete or not, uh, whether you're in a remote canoe in Maine or whether you're in the little lake inside Prospect Park um, that we grew up as kids from New York City. Prospect Park is in Brooklyn. Um, it was not designed by the Olmsteads. It was designed by somebody else. Um, but it follows the mantra of Central Park as being a very large urban park, smack dab in the middle city, meant for the people of the city. Um, so it's a very heavily used park. We all grew up there, we all picnic there, um, and think about that a lot. So I think uh, you know a lot about you know being a scientist is making sure that we connect everybody to the importance of all those ecosystem functions, whether it's inside Jamaica Bay, New York City, or it's uh, you know the Poudre Canyon, or it's the Alaska Wilderness. And I think sometimes, as Sarah knows, we push really hard to make people forget that there is, or try try and make people forget that there's any grading of nature. Nature is nature, whether it occurs inside New York City or occurs in a remote setting. And we tend to give almost like grades to nature, like, well, this is really good nature experience. You know, you're out in rural Alaska versus Central Park. But it's the same nature, it's the same bumblebee. And understanding the pressures on those systems is different, but that's what we're scientists for, is to understand those pressures on those systems and how those systems respond. So I don't know if that quite answers your question, but my toast is burning, so I'll let you ask the second question. (laughs) You know, that's a great point about how we each experience nature differently. This leads us to the topic of community science, where people from all backgrounds can participate in science. Yeah, community science is really cool because this is where people in the community can jump in and collect data and share it with scientists who then use the data for studies, which can then ideally be shared back to the public for information and possible action. Yeah, as a researcher, Sarah has some cool insights into the advancements of citizen science. I think it's become uh, easier and easier as the technology has um, accelerated and improved, especially in some of these remote places like where I do my field research in Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Park and that everyone now has access to, um, pretty much everyone has access to a cell phone um, where you can download you know, field guides, you can participate in scientific inquiry and discovery through citizen science applications, and um, it's as simple as, you know, taking photos of what you see outside um, in your backyard from the parks um, and and so forth, and contributing to the data collection that um, researchers may use, or perhaps a curator of a museum, or maybe a class, or, um, you know, these large long-term monitoring programs that are just curious as to what the public is seeing, um, what's catching their eye, and tracking patterns in, you know, species presence or um, flowering periods, um, migration patterns, as as seen with birds and, you know, with monarch butterflies and, and so forth. And so I think the ways to engage the public has become, at least even in the past, you know, eight years that I've been working on this project and um, towards my dissertation, um, you know, the amount of technology advancements that have allowed for greater participation, broader participation of all, um, you know, disciplines of all ages, experiences, and so forth 
has only become more and more um, accessible, which is great to see. And I think it'll only continue to improve and allow for um, more engagement and more participation in those sciences. Um, so I would say citizen science has certainly allowed for that um, increase in, in participation and curiosity as a whole. I think I sort of agree with Sarah, but I, and, uh, unfortunately, I think citizen science hasn't reached its full potential yet. Um, there's actually quite a, a debate going on, even just over the name of citizen science, of whether that is exclusionary. But most participants in citizen science efforts um, tend to be from a very narrow demographic. And the question is, why does that occur? And why are we not doing a better job of, you know, democratizing science and nature that it, it is really accessible to everybody, but we don't actually you know, maybe welcome, or we have this sort of internal hierarchy. Um, you run into this in citizen science where people will say, well, this data is not accurate or can't be used or things like that. And, um, you know, you put it to a lower tier, it's harder to publish all these things that go on with citizen science, but yet it, it has the beauty of giving science to everybody, anyone who's got a cell pocket and cell, cell phone and worldwide, you can use citizen science, we use, you know, our cell phones in the highlands of Peru and document species just using a cell phone. And that's an important part of science and discovery. But, it's, you know, I think it, it, it really still just so ties to the problem with nature is the scientists studying nature, I guess is a way to say it. Um, is that we, we have this sort of tear in our head about true wilderness versus not true wilderness. You know, in the park service, we struggle with this a lot, you know, because wilderness has a hardcore definition in the park service. And then how we manage it becomes another whole issue on how you manage wilderness versus non-wilderness inside of a park. And that's an important piece that people like ecologists studying don't necessarily pick up on then, okay, now when you take that wilderness concept and you think you're going to manage it, and how do you manage it? Um, and what does that mean to manage wilderness? You know, so a good example is the Ramble in Central Park, um, which where Chris Cooper was, um, had police called on him for bird watching, essentially um, after his encounter with a white woman with her dog off leash. But the Ramble is actually managed <clears throat> within Central Park as a quote unquote wilderness area. It's And, and the term that they use is, um, you know, unmanaged um, in, in a natural state for Central Park and the Central Park Conservancy. Um, Pasta Park has a similar area um, which they manage for wilderness. So it's overgrown, it's not mowed. It's, uh, you know, species are allowed to go kind of amok in there um, and they manage it for that experience. You know, that sense of going into, you know, deeper woods or shrubberies or so forth. And you see a lot of this in many, many parks worldwide. You'll see city parks where you can you know, step off a trail and you're in what they call a wilderness experience, which might be a small, narrow trail instead of the big paved trail um, or the, these five senses trails that you see a lot of popping up on various parks where, you know, it's supposed to be quiet. You can listen to things. You can experience, you know, closed in trees in city places. So we're defining nature that way, which is very much a Western you know, centric way of defining nature and how other cultures define nature could be totally different. Um, but we just maybe within the U.S. don't pay enough attention to that. Nature is very much defined by culture um, because as far as the planet is concerned, it has one <laughs> one view of, of nature. But as far as humans are concerned, we've got gazillion views depending on what cultural construct you come out of. So I think that's an important part of just thinking about how we connect with nature I want to emphasize a point that was just made about how we're each going to connect to nature differently. I just think that that's so important. Katie, have you connected personally through nature with citizen science? Yeah, of course. I am a Colorado kid, you know. Um, and for those of you listening who don't know much about Colorado, we are pretty well known for being super outdoorsy. Everyone is outside all the time. And I grew up in that. I spent a ton of my childhood just out in nature. And I suppose it's kind of the more typical view of nature that 
we think of, that lack of anything man-made in sight, you know, raw wilderness that is that contested term (laughs) Dr. Bowser was talking about. But I also grew up on a ranch, and that's agriculture, and that's nature too. It's an ecosystem. It's just a, uh, it's a managed ecosystem that we take part in, but it's still nature. Coming back to the topic of community science, though, I have kind of a funny story about how I got involved years ago. Uh, I was down working in Guatemala, and we were riding around in the back of a pickup truck on the way to coffee farms. And I would always say to my friend Abdiel, ¿Qué es eso? ¿Qué es eso? ¿Cómo se llama este? Uh, What's that? What's that? What do you call this? And I was just curious about everything. And after about a week of peppering my friend with these questions that he did not know the answer to, he finally turned to me and said, Flores, mi niña. Flowers, my child. (laughs) And we had a good laugh because I really was acting like a child, (laughs) just asking a thousand and one questions. But it did get me thinking. How many plants and insects did I actually know the names of back at home? And I realized I didn't know anything about a lot of the ecosystem I grew up in. So I decided to change that. And that led to my participation in community science. And eventually, I think it played a huge role in my decision to go back to school to become a scientist. Cody, you've actually been on the other side, right? And used community collected data as a scientist like Sarah, haven't you? How did it help with your project? Yeah, thanks for asking. I've used citizen science in a few projects, including in my own personal life, because I think it's a great way to study my own relationship to the ecosystem. I've also notably used citizen science to gather points of beaver sightings within Denver, Colorado city limits. This is cool because we're able to study the relationship between beavers and people in Denver. From the citizen science points and other environmental conditions, We looked at where else in Denver the likely habitat for beavers exists. From this, we're able to look at what's the best overall outcome for all stakeholders, including the beavers. Wow, that sounds like a really cool project and outcome. It really sort of underlines the importance of working together as a community, because as researchers, you couldn't easily scout out and find all of those beavers in Denver. And you can help make management decisions based on that data collected by community scientists. So community science really does make a difference and opens up the potential for broader impact studies. Which brings us to today's action point. If you are listening to this and you'd like to know more about community science projects and how you can get involved, we recommend that you go to sitsci.org and click on the projects link at the top. SitSci.org is a website that provides tools and resources for scientists and connects community members to projects that they can help with. Again, that's SitSci.org, C-I-T-S-C-I dot org. Take a look at how you can get involved. This was the second episode exploring the Youth Environmental Alliance in higher education. We do have more to come from our friends here as we lead up to COP26, The Road to Glasgow. Deep gratitude to Dr. Bowser, Sarah Whipple, and the whole Yeah Network. I do want to highlight one last time, the Yeah Network is looking to grow. To find out more information, go to yeah-net.org. And of course, please follow the Livable Future podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and on social media. Tune in next week to learn about the shifting policy change in the U.S. national park system. And we hope you have a great day.